Hello, everyone. Welcome to Kachiv AVA. We'll get started here in a second. Today's AVA is you know, things to think about before moving into Vault. Um, kind of the, get everyone the overview of the agenda. I'll do introductions here in a minute, but we're really you know, going to look at things that we should be thinking about, um, kind of like organization of files and folders, file properties, how are we managing the revisions, um, file security, the pros and cons, and then, you know, a high overview of, you know, our options of how do we get our metadata for, and our files from where they are now in the vault in a usable way. So for those that don't know me, my name is Jason Cormach. I'm one of the application engineers here at Kativ. Um, prior to working at Kativ, I did technical support at Autodesk. And so I probably talked to uh, some of you I recognize. And um, yeah, so basically anything vault PBM, uh, related is in my wheelhouse. So basically, you know, today we're really just talking about how do we manage data because we're all making data every, you know, every time we make a new product or every time we need to make a change to something, we're making data, whether it's for AutoCAD and Benner, you know, we have spec docs that go along with our drawings. Eventually those drawings are getting turned into PDFs. Those PDFs are getting printed out and maybe the shops using them as a reference for, for um, making, to start the manufacturing process. They're getting marked up maybe by the customer. And so we're during the design process, no matter what phase we're in, we are creating data from the very beginning to figuring out what the specs are, depending on what kind of industry you're in, in terms of if it's manufactured to order. Um, and then we have to decide what are we doing with all this data? And from the poll, it seemed like a, a fair amount of people are still using a Windows shared drive. And, you know, it's one of those things that's very easy to use. And it has um, some advantages in terms of it's easy to set up and easy to start using. And, and as we'll see, um, as you start to add more users and grow, we kind of outgrow that model. And, and we, we're making decisions while we're using that that we're not fully aware, you know. And the first thing that comes to my mind is when we start making or using any CAD tool and we start managing files, it's like, how are we managing the version of a file in terms of who's making it, the changes? Are those changes being documented? And then more importantly, um, when do we decide that a, a, a product or a design set is done and we want to have a revision and then how are we managing that? So before we talk about revisions or some of the other things, we really have to think about organization um, because no matter how many end users you have, CAD users are making content, you know, you might start off with a hundred or a few thousand files, but th that grows to hundreds of thousands of millions of files. Um, in a few years, depending on how much you're designing. So the first thing that always comes to my mind is how are we organizing the file? Because the, you know, everyone's used to using um, Windows Explorer and browsing files. And so how are those being organized? Are we organizing them by product, by customer, um, by serial numbers? And realistically, it really comes down to really getting it set up and defining the organizational structure and being very conscious about the organizational structure so that all the users are putting the files in the right spot. Um, and as we'll talk about a little later, um, when we get to files is, it's also really important to think about, you know, unique naming. Um, and, and we'll talk a little more about what that is, but the way that I see it is it's taking someone, usually the CAD admin to take ownership to make sure that everyone is making content, you know, a lot of us think about these things as files, whether I look at Vault and more importantly, the data, you know, this is your company's intellectual property. Your company is spending a significant amount of money on all the people and all the technology to make these drawings. And these drawings are the blueprints that make product, the products that you make, which then eventually get sold. And so without these drawings, you don't have a product to sell. And so um, it's easy to think of them as files. I like to think of them you know, it's really the intellectual property. The, these files are more valuable um, than we might realize because of all of the metadata, all of the technical specs, um, 
and never mind just all the, the time of everyone's, uh, all the engineering time to bring a product to market. And so it's not just a file, it's really a, a capsule of all the time and effort to go from an idea to manufactured product. So when we're thinking about organization, the, I think the thing that gets used the least that I think is the most important is libraries in terms of if it's a unique part, it should be inside of a folder structure related to a product or a customer. But if it's like a purchase part or something that's used across multiple uh, product lines that don't change, you know, usually it's a purchase part, um, is really getting in the habit of using a library sooner rather than later. And, and we'll talk about that a little bit, but the whole purpose behind it is that when we get files, we wanna reuse as much content as possible. We don't wanna start making a new, um, a new product from scratch. We don't wanna to have to model every nut and bolt every time we start over. And so you know, the real benefits of any organization, whether it's Vault, whether it's the file store, is that the, the CAD users can find the content so they can reuse and, and in turn make the models faster. And so eventually everyone has to pick a, 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 a file or numbering scheme. And I've seen, uh, I've had the pleasure of working with a lot of customers over the years and it's, you know, everyone does it slightly different, but everyone's trying to solve the same problem. You know, do you, you know, because we need most of the time, ideally, we want to be having unique file names. So whether we use a customer name or a project number and then some other information and then the extension, um, a very common thing, especially working on a Windows shared folder, is you have file name, you put the description in the file name and then eventually put do a save as and put the rev in the file name. And that's very common because if you have your CAD data on a shared folder, you don't necessarily have very many options of how do you manage the rev. You can manage it in the file name. I've seen people manage it in a inventor property or a custom property, um, or it's on the drawing, or it's a text field. Um, there's a lot of different ways to go about it, but in the end, eventually, CAD data needs to get into a PDM server into Vault so that it's easier to manage the information because we're basically, by putting the rev name in the file, we're kind of trying to do things that you know, Windows Explorer really isn't designed for. Never mind, there's no way for us to really easily um, lock down those files, control who has access, sure, we, we have um, some file-based security, but not nearly the granularity that's needed. And by us making these kind of assumptions while we were starting prior to managing our data in Vault in a central location, you know, we're, we're making these decisions and when we're going to be affecting things. And for me, the, the file names is, is crucial because it's going to affect and ripple effects across how Vault gets set up you know, if your end goal is to eventually link Vault to your ERP or use Vault to PLM to ERP, there's a lot of different options there, but some one of those systems have to be the, the source of truth. And so every company is different. Everyone has uh, file numbers have to start somewhere. And so, you know, some of you might already have catalogs. And so the file name mean convention has all, already been well thought out. Um, and all the, the ranges and things. But then, you know, we have on the other spectrum, I've seen, you know, part one, part two, part three, and literally, you know, the description is button one, button two, or red button one. Um, and so that makes it easy to find things in Windows Explorer, but that doesn't help us when we um, move to Vault because we have to go through the process of basically trying to fix these file names, get the description out of the name, get the rev out of the name. And so even though this is a, an attractive um, way of, and a very easy way when you're using a Windows folder structure to capture the file name, the description and the rev 
um, in the short term, it's very easy, but in the long term, that's creating tremendous uh, amount of work later. And I'll, I'll show a little bit later about that. The other thing I see that's very often is that we're not taking a full advantage of the capabilities in these CAD tools. You know, are we using custom properties like an AutoCAD? Are we using block attributes? And um, that's a big one in terms of if we have legacy drawings and those legacy drawings has a title block, but the title block is just filled out with a text field. That text field is unmappable in Vault. It needs to be a um, a block attribute. And so from an end user CAD perspective, you know, making the modification to the AutoCAD file is really not that different, but it makes a humongous difference later on when you move to Vault, because now you have all these legacy files, but no easy way to extract that metadata. And so you have the metadata, you have the in, in the file, but no easy way later on to get it into Vault. And if the metadata is not involved, then we can't really search on it. And so, you know, it's a small, small decision when we're making an AutoCAD title block in terms of filling the, the, the start part with a text field versus building a block attribute. Um, you know, it's a very small decision that has um, a tremendous effect in time because at the end of the day, we won't have the time to go back and fix those files, you know. So whatever decision we make, or and and some of you might find yourself, you know, you've inherited the decisions that someone's already made five, ten years ago. And so the real goal of this is just trying to get everyone to think about where where are you personally at, and then how do you move forward in terms of cleaning this up. Um, you know, because the nice thing is in Vault, when you can map to these properties and you're moving the rev, um, Vault has the ability to check compliance to know if the metadata in Vault matches the, the inventor property or the CAD property on the drawing to know if there's a discrepancy. So that's, that's really the big issue is we don't want to get a drawing set, uh, you know, and make a PDF and send that PDF to the shop and accidentally send them the wrong rev or print the drawing set and you know and not realize that they're making the wrong version until they've wasted a lot of time and material and so there's little tools like this that make a, a humongous effect on just making sure that everyone's using the latest version of files that you're printing and looking at the latest revision because the revision is really the most important save point in the design process. So, you know, some of the ways of, you know, without Vault managing the rev, like I mentioned, you know, it goes, sometimes it goes into a file and now you have the same file in Vault multiple times with different um, rev information. And so it's very hard to go from the rev in a file name, whereas Vault, manages where you just have the file name and it manages the rev as a system property. Um, you know, some of you might have legacy data where the I property in Inventor is correct. Um, and there's a, a couple of different ways to, to work with it. That's probably the easiest scenario because at least you have the metadata in a property that we can leverage um, for files or for revs that are in the file, um, you know, that takes a lot more work. That takes, you know, creating scripts, making renaming tools, having to work with a reseller to use the DTU tool to, to massage the data and load the data, update all the properties, whether that's, you know, properties on an item or properties on a um, file. Um, and so to avoid all that work, it's far easier to be conscious about how are we managing the rev? And in my opinion, ideally in an I property so that later on you have a lot more flexibility and options. Um, and the other thing that we think about is, you know, 
when we're using a, a Windows file share, you know, we can control, sure, who can read and modify files and who can make mod modifications to them, but we have no way of granularly changing the, someone's level of access. You know, it's, as most of you probably already know, in Vault, it's like, sure, we have the same commands in terms of read, modify, and delete, and, you know, in the later version of Vault's download. And that really gives us, between that and role-based security, we can really use uh, the state-based security to basically weave the necessary file-based security that we need. And so at a high level for anyone that's realizes that in Vault, the blank space is basically like a soft deny, which means that if I have a CAD user that's in the CAD user group and in an administrative group, if it's a blank space, the allow will allow this particular user to delete the file. If it's a deny and they're in both groups, admin and CAD, even though the admin group has allow, um, Vault will default to deny always wins. And so most of the time you would use like a, a blank space, which is a soft deny. And that way you can accommodate if you have a user in two different groups, um, it allows them to have the higher level of access. And that's one of the beauty things. It gives us the ability to really fine tune who has access to what and when. And as we'll see a little bit later, when we change states and manage the life cycle and the re revision scheme in Vault, we can have the state-based securities change depending on if a file is in a work in progress state or in a release state, whereas we don't have anywhere close to that kind of granularity with doing a Windows shared drive. It's basically just trusting everyone um, to either have read, write, uh, or delete. And there's, and in that model, there's no way to really kind of track who's doing what when and it's you know if you're not careful two users could accidentally keep overriding each other's um, settings especially if you have complicated models that share a lot of files that aren't in a library file um, you know that could have cascading effects if two assemblies reference the same subassembly but two CAD users don't realize it and they keep making the same different modifications to a subassembly they could be inadvertently accidentally updating someone else's assembly and not realizing it. And so it's getting more granularity over how everything is linked together. Um, and so really when, once we have all the data, at, at some point we have to get the data in vault. You know, these are just a few ways of getting the data in. We can fix any, open the file, fix anything we need, make sure it regens and then check it into vault, making sure that we have unique file names. We can use the auto loader to bulk load it if the uh, data is clean. And what I mean by that, you know, vault, to be able to check something in vault, every link needs to be resolved. So we can't have any broken links. And then, you know, you could use the uh, inventor task scheduler or in, in a lot of cases, what I'm finding is, most of the data, if it's not been meticulously maintained, requires a, a fair amount of cleanup and then having to make a custom package and working with the reseller to um, bulk load the files into Vault. Because if that's really kind of the only ways to kind of automate pulling out some of the metadata, especially if it's in the file name, you know, pulling out the rev numbers, pulling out the um, descriptions and then getting that information populated. So let's jump to a demo. Okay, so we're in Vault, I logged in. Just a quick example, you know, as we know the, when we're using Vault with Inventor, everyone's using a vaulted Inventor project file. And that way everyone is going to be pointing to the same content center location and everyone's using the same working folder. And I would highly recommend treating the same thing, like even if you're still on a, um, a Windows shared drive, like if everyone is referencing to the same paths, 
That way all your assemblies are referencing the same library location. Um, keeping things as clean as possible like that makes things uh, a little bit easier. But as we can see, once files get into Vault, Vault assigns them to a category, which is this little icon right here. We can also see the category in the system properties. And it's the category that really controls everything. It controls whether a file gets file-based lifecycle. It controls what revision scheme it gets. It controls what properties get mapped. And depending on how Vault is set up, uh, it also controls this compliance issue, which is what one of the features of Vault that lets me know that the metadata in this file does not match the system property or the system revision B. And so, um, and that's one of the beauty things about Vault is by having the metadata and getting the data in here cleanly, um, I can learn about this information and not have to open up every file and manually check the revision, you know, which is no different than learning the Vault um, status icons. These status icons let me know a world of information in terms of that I don't have this file on my local folder. So basically right now we're, you know, it's a Vault as a client server relationship. We're looking at the client application. The server application has been installed on a dedicated computer. And so if I do a get, I'm basically downloading the file from the server to my computer, to the working folder. And when I do that, the SAS icon updates. So in this case, the round circle, the clear round circle means that my working folder has the exact file version as it is on the server. So I have the latest file in this working folder. And as far as I'm concerned, this learning these status icons are probably the most helpful feature because it prevents you from always having to come to the working folder. I wouldn't wanna to have to open up this drawing every time I wanted to make sure that I have the latest one. And so it's these icons that really give us the flexibility. And so anytime we see a status non-equivalent, and this is something that everyone kind of starts to run into, especially if you're mapping the system property of the revision to the I property in Inventor. And so we can come down here, we can tell exactly what property is having the problem. In this particular case, um, I can just do a synchronized property to resolve this because when I went from release to work in progress, we bumped the, the revision. And so the file revision is still at A, but we know that the system revision is at B. And so in this case, since we're looking at file-based life cycles, I can synchronize the property. Vault synchronizes the property and make sure that updates the information, the appliance goes away. And this way, I know that when it's time for someone to review this and open up the drawing, that this particular drawing will now have Rev B in it because I've gone and I've made a mapping. So in Vault, there's really two. There's a out of the box, there's Rev number, which you know is a bi-directional mapping of Rev information. In this case, I've come in here and I've linked the system rev so that vault pushes the system rev to the file. And this is very helpful because this is just helps me keep the information up to date and know that, you know, now that I've switched to having vault manage the revision of files, this is a way for me to know if a file is up to date. And so in the beginning, when we're loading files into vault, Vault is going to default to Rev A, which is fine if you're, you know, if you're a new Inventor user and you can and you started using Inventor and Vault, um, you know, you don't have to do anything. But most of us have legacy data, and we've managed to um, capture the revision in other ways. And so, for those particular legacy files. There's a lot of different ways to do it. You know, one of them is 
for instance, like this one. So in AutoCAD, so this is um, just a, a blank file that has a rev block. And inside here, we have our attribute. And so it's linked. We have our block attribute. And so in this case, it's very easy because once we have that mapping, if I know that that drawing is really supposed to be on rev E, Vault has the tools where I come in here and just change the revision from A to E. And next time I sync the, the properties, the metadata gets synced. And it lets me know that it was able to change the rev information in the file from A to E. And then this way, we're ready for to release the file. Um, so in this case, I have to do a get first to make sure. So every time we sync a property or update a property, we bump the version of a file. And oh, it's because I still have it open. So Windows won't let us have two applications run, two applications accessing the same file at the same time. And so by making these maps and taking the time to make sure that our title blocks are set up right, uh, this can really save a lot of work moving forward in terms of, and keeping the accuracy since we know that you know, the real goal is having Vault manage the rev. And so if we look at, let's say, the sample file. So let's say it's a legacy file. You can see that based off of the drawing that we're on rev C. And if I had hundreds, if not thousands of files, um, I'm not going to want to involve do what I just did. I'm not going to want to have to select everything and make the change. And that works great if we're fixing one file. But if I don't know what the rev is on a thousand files or 10,000 files, uh, that's a lot of tedious work of opening drawings, see what it is coming here, change the revision. Um, and so this is just one way to do it. If we make a custom property, we can get the metadata. So anytime we make any user-defined property, we'll just make, uh, we'll call it temp rev. And we have to tell it what category we want this to show up on. So in this case, since we're checking in inventor data, I have a rule that assigned the engineering category to inventor data. So we want this property to show up there and we need to make a mapping so that Vault knows which I property we want to extract it from. And so in this case, because it, I'm mapping to an I property and not a custom property, I can really map, I just need almost any file that has the property I want. And in this case, I want uh, user status, which will get me the uh, revision number. And in this case, I want the file to push the metadata to Vault because I don't want Vault to accidentally update it. In this case, I'm basically making the whole purpose behind this property is just for me, an easy way for me to get and see what all of the uh, rev numbers are for all the legacy data without having to go and open up every file. And in this case, if we turn on these two things, we can see that this particular property has been mapped a few different times. Um, that it should be fine. And so anytime we make a property and we want to see it, we need to also make a change to the, uh, the category because we want the property to show up on the category so that it And so we made one, it was a 
Uh, it should be there. Why is it not? So temp rev map to file engineering. Go to categories and we make sure that it's on the list. So we select the category that we want and then we make sure temp rev. Okay, so in this case, it is already assigned to the category that we want, which is important so that we actually can see the metadata. And so once we have the mapping set up right, in this case, I'm just gonna check in one file, but this is really would be used if you're checking in over a thousand files. And so we can tell that I'm on rev C, we're gonna check this in. This particular rev is you know, mapped to the I property revision number, which is probably one of the more common ways to track the revision of a file when using a network shared drive. Um, one of the downsides to tracking this way is that you have the file and the latest version, but because of the way Windows works, every time you save a file, there's no way for you to go back to the history. And so in this case, without doing a save as, I have no way of knowing what was at rev B or rev A. And so that's one of the downsides to using a Windows shared folder is that sure, everyone can update it, but um, you lose that kind of information. And so, so as we can see, the file was checked into Vault, Vault assigned it to the category engineering based off the rules. Vault starts the revision scheme at A, but we know that this is legacy file and we know that that's not what we wanted. And so once the legacy information is in here, you know, we could do like we did before, we could just change the revision scheme and I could type in C, but if we had thousands of files in here, one of the options is that we can link this to a property. And so if we go to uh, temp rev, it would update this information it did not. And so what we need to do is that it needs to have the rev information here. Let's see. I think I, what I know I did, let's go to properties. Temp rev. In this case, it looks like it's getting in the way because I already have one, another one that's doing it. Um, let me go and we'll just edit the one that's already there. Um, so rev number, we want it to go from the file to update the metadata. And let's add in this particular case, because I, because rev number isn't down here, let's, so anytime we need to add a property that's not on the category by default, we can always just come in here and manually add it for files that are already been checked into vault. And this is, a good time to point out, it's it's always good to test things and add all the properties that you want because you wouldn't wanna have to come in here and add this property to these files every time, um, every time that we check something in, it's better to take the time to figure out what you need. And you, know, you can track all kinds of information with these user-defined properties I've seen everything from you know rough dimension numbers or you know a rough stock or the name of the tool the cnc tool that is used to make this part you know all of these properties we can search on and so it gives us 
um, the ability, but because we have a property, we have, it was able to capture the, um, the revision information. And now we can go back here and change the revision and we'll use rev number. Rev number. And so by doing it this way and by you know capturing the information with a, a user-defined property, getting the information updated, you know, we could imagine that we could have a thousand different files in here. We would not want to come in here and have to manually type in every single revision number. And so this is one way, if you have the rev information that's tied to a property that you can map, whether it's an I property for an inventor, whether it's a custom property or user-defined uh, property in the title block, um, a block attribute, as long as we get the metadata into Vault, we have a, a very easy way to set the rev of everything. And so this way we set the rev for everything. And at this point, once the, you know, we've changed the metadata in Vault. And we can see, you know, now that the file's in Vault, we can see what user did what when in terms of what did it come in as we were able to get it to the right revision. At this point, we still have a compliance issue because we haven't pushed these file, this metadata back to the file. We've just updated um, the metadata in Vault. So we got the system property of Rev, which is what we want because if we want Vault to maintain the revision number, and so now that Vault maintains the revision number, we know that this is the correct revision number because we used the previous property to extract it from Vault. Now, when I do a, um, just do a get to download the latest, but now that we have all this information, we can do one more sync to make sure that the files themselves, that the CAD file itself, so that the drawing has the right information. We get rid of this compliance issue because as most of you might know, in Vault, there's rules. And one of the rules is I can't release this particular file if I have compliance issues. And that's just another check to make sure that I'm not releasing files um, that don't have the correct information on the drawing. And so at this point, with the change state, I can include all the children and parents because there's other rules involved that prevents us from releasing a file without including the parent and all the children. And this way we can see what it is. We can release everything. And now we've basically gotten our CAD files in the vault. We were able to extract the rev. We were able to get the system variable in vault rev to match the rev that we were using previously because we have to track the rev somewhere without vault. But then we eventually have to go through the process of migrating the files into Vault and figuring out how we're gonna get this value to match whatever the legacy rev is because of we were tracking it some other way, whether it's on the file in an I property, in an access database, in an Excel document, eventually we have to make the transition. And this is really where we wanna be having the files in Vault with unique names because at this point now Vault is managing the revision. And so if I change the state and leave the revision or release and go to work in progress, Vault will automatically bump the revision to the next one in the scheme. And at this point, we can see that I'm able to check the files out, make any changes needed. And so this is as expected because I have the mapping. And, and the reason why some of you might not have this or see that, that all has to do with the mapping for, um, for revision. It's this mapping right here and making sure that it's the first one in the order. It's this is the one that lets Vault know that this is the most important and that Vault is controlling the rev and it needs to make sure that the 
that metadata in the file matches the metadata in Vault. And so because I just changed the state from release to work in progress and bumped the revision, we have changed the system property in Vault. But if I were to open this file, we'll see that the drawing is out of date. because I haven't come in here and I haven't done synchronized properties. So I could come in here, I could synchronize the properties if I had this checked out, but you know, large assemblies, we're not gonna do that if we don't need to. So that's one way to do it. The other way is just to come up here and do synchronized properties and let Vol update the inventor files and change the metadata. You know, so there's, those are two different ways to do the same thing. Um, but the most important thing is making sure that the metadata is correct prior to um, removing to the next state. Because we need the files to be in a release state because that, that drives everything in terms of whether we let Vault create the PDF, whether we create the PDF, the most important thing is getting our design data in a release state with the correct revision so that, because now that it's in a release state and I do a get on here, I no longer have modify access to this file. And that's the beauty of the of, of Vault in terms of being able to change the level of access depending on the state. And so right now, no one has access to it besides the job processor, which is if I had that set up, it would be creating a PDF right now. But that's one, you know, it's the state-based security that adds its own layer of, of flexibility of who has access when. You have the role-based security for the user, depending on, you know, can they update or delete things? And so it's really that kind of weaving together that gives us the ability to centralize all the CAD data so that we can find it easier, reuse the security settings to allow us to figure out exactly who has access when through the state-based security. And all that can't be done until we're in Vault and we have these. So if I come down here to, you know, we look at that my, life, my file-based lifecycle, we can see you know, that the CAD users and admins can see it when it's work in progress. And, you know, once the file's in the review state, Office users can now look at it and make comments. But once it's in the release state, I'm unable to make any changes to it. You know, it's this kind of level of granularity access that can't be achieved um, through Dropbox or through Windows folder shares. And now that I have a file that's been released a few times, when I do a get to download it, sure, I can get the latest version of a file, but I can easily go back and, and get rev C of this drawing and assembly and all of the associated parts. And so it's, it's this ability to get and either review an older version if I need to print out a drawing or need to view it, but it's this information that gets lost in, in the Windows shared drive because there's no mechanism to know what version of a file things are referencing at depending on the version. And so that's really kind of in a nutshell what I wanted to just show today is that really we need to, you know, think about um, how we're gonna organize files because, you know, the most common way is we're gonna look for a product we might know a series number and find it this way. And so if we don't have a folder structure that makes sense and we don't have all the, the related information together, um, it might be harder to find what we want. It's also useful to leverage the categories. And right now I'm just using one category for all engineering data. You know, I've seen every, everything from you know using a few categories and I've seen some customers take the time and make like 60 categories, a, a category for every file type and every um, subtype. And 
add all kinds of user defined information. Um, my recommendation would be is, you know, less is more in terms of just because you can map every single property does not mean you need 200 properties. In my mind, you should be looking for properties like customer, um, things that you're gonna wanna search on, metadata that you wanna be able to see, like information that's on a title block without having to open up every drawing and, and manually look at the title block. Sure, if you needed to, you could use the preview and look at the title block. You could right mouse click and view and window to look at the title block. But if you take the time to set up the mapping to have all the same fields here, you don't have to do any of that. And now you can search by the title block um, by using the advanced features in terms of being able to search on any system or user defined property and making a compound search so that you can find exactly what you want. It's easy to forget how, uh, you know, how easy in the beginning it is to reuse content. But, it, you know, if your company eventually grows and you, you know, have a vault that's, you know, replicated across three continents and then you have three um, AVFS servers for remote offices in those regions, um, you could have millions of files in vault. Um, and so in the beginning, you might not think that you need it, but you know, it's good to think about how would I find something if I had to sort through a million files or more. Um, so kind of just kind of recap, you know, we, you just get Inventor, you install it, you get, you're excited, you know, it's, that's the time to really start thinking about how you're going to organize, you know, especially the file naming conventions, because those naming conventions are going to have cascading effects into your ERP, into PLM later down the line. And it's far easier to clean it up now or make it or, or you know, decide which tool is going to be the source of truth. What is your num naming or numbering scheme? so that it makes sense, so that everyone's using the same numbering information and so that the, the file name has value. Because if not, you'll have to clean it up later and that'll just be another roadblock from preventing connecting Vault to other business tools. And, and really, that's really the goal is to get rid of all of the manual entry. And any, you know, if you have to enter the same information twice, um, you know, there's room for improvement. And so by thinking about the properties that we need, because if the CAD user is adding the property to the file, when you check it into Vault, Vault should take the, the and scrape out those properties so that no one has to enter it again. And, and, and then also thinking about, you know, to make files be able to be reused, you gotta be able to find what you need. And, you know, if we think about, you know, drawings as, you know, that represents hundreds if not thousands of hours of a lot of people's work, uh, we need to really think about how we're securing that. How is all that intellectual property being secure? Because you know we don't want someone to just download the entire Windows Share drive and then quit and go start their own business. You know, there's there's a lot of time and energy, and it's not just a file in my mind, you know, it is. Uh, uh, the cornerstone of every business that manufactures a product. Um, without that product, it would be hard to survive. So here's a couple of, of links, and I'll, I'll put them in the chat here in a minute um, in terms of, for more information in terms of like, how do you create, like if you've, if you've just installed Vault for the first time, you might have had the experience of not being able to check files into Vault because you haven't created a vaulted inventor project file. Um, you know, there's a great article about how do you transfer rev numbers from vault to the file automatically. And so these Autodesk help articles talk about how to do that. How do we, you know, we can sync other information from vault to um, a file, for instance, if we wanted to see the state of, um, on the drawing or how do we map to um, a block attribute because there's a few extra steps. Um, 
And so these are a great article's worth um, taking a look at because, and it's also good to, to practice and test some of these, especially when you are mapping a system property to a drawing that can have um, cascading effects on if you have a significant amount of files already in Vault that maybe don't have metadata or have old metadata. Um, it's good to run some tests in a test environment before you make a change that might um, affect all of your, your drawings. And so we'll just kind of move into Q and A. Um, so, okay, using vault revision data in drawing rev history table in case of a misspelling type, is there a way to edit the column once in vault? So yeah, if you make a user defined property in vault, you could change the name of that after the fact if it needed to be changed. Um, if it's a typo in the metadata, that was checked in, that can't be changed. But if it's the, the column header, you could change that. But yeah, exactly. So if the if you make a property, a user-defined property, and so like, for instance, the, the property that I made, if uh, properties, uh, so test, like if, if I made a typo here, you could always come in here and, you know, let's just add a period or something. Um, you can, change this, which would affect the, the header of um, the rev history tally. But if if it was the like the metadata down like in like for instance if I wanted if there was a, a typo in the company. So uh, in this case if I try to modify it because it's in a release date, I can't. So let's bump the so in this case since I'm making a typo meaning that I'm, I'm not affecting form fit or function. In this case, I'm comfortable using quick change to get me back into a state that I can make a change without bumping the revision. Because if, if I went from release to work in progress, I would bump the revision. But in this case, if I just want to change, let's say there's a typo in description, you could change it there. The metadata, um, but, so I can change it well if I find it while I'm still in the same revision. But if I were to um, if I find the the typo after I bump the revision, I can't go back and fix that. I can only fix it if I find it in the revision that I'm at. Um, let's see next question. So how do we get Vault to set up to automatically send a file to for check or markup to file for check and return to creator? Um, so in that regard, if you wanted to, that would be where you would use uh, a Vault Pro feature, the engineering change orders. If you wanted to um, assign a file to a change order and the change order you have all kinds of different rules and um and it has its own life cycle but one of the states in the change order is the ability to um when it gets to a check or a review state to have someone review it and either add a comment back or there's a way to use this and and redline it um, and so you can either redline it through the UCO process, someone else could, um, you could also redline something and not use engineering process. Um, it just depends on how the workflow, um, it just depends on how you do it. But if you want like the, a person that has the approved status to get a notification that they need to go check something, that's where you would use the engineering change order because you can, um, have a routing list and you can assign certain users to be approvers um, or checkers, depending on what workflow you're using to basically have the engineering change order show up in their list um, so that they know they need to do something. But by default, um, if, you were, if I'm just using a file-based workflow and I'm 
you know, so let's say if I'm on like Vault Workgroup, which doesn't have the change orders, if I put this in for review, what you would need to do is that whoever it is that its job is to check things, they could make a save search because we can search on all of this metadata. So if I make a save search for state uh, contains for review, and then I can save this uh, for review. Then this way, because, so this way they don't have, you know, we wouldn't want them to have to go and look into every folder and find, you know, is it ready for me to do something? We could just make a safe search and this would basically show them every file and vault that's in a for review state. And then they could use the go to folder, which would take them straight to whatever subfolder, which is a super useful command when you have thousands of folders. Um, and this takes you right to the right location. And at this point, I could just view it in window. I could open it if I have the a CAD tool that can open it and view it. And then at that point, um, send an IM or an email letting them know that it looks fine. Like if I review it and I have the level of access, I could just put this thing to release. If I need someone else to do work, I could put it back into a uh, work in progress and I could put a comment in here, you know, please update, update, you know, uh, finish. And, you know, so that's one way to communicate and, and have all that information tracked in the history because comments are in the history. So there's a lot of different ways. It just depends on um, what what do you need and what kind of information um, that you want. And so you could use save searches so that the people that need to review things can usually find things that are in review based off the state. If we want them to have a um, get a, a notification, then then you would need Vault Pro and and look into either a change order list here. Um, or, you know, farther down the timeline, like if you connected Vault to a PLM, um, like Fusion Manage, then you would move the change order and the items to the PLM part, and, and then you could do um, the change orders through a web interface. So there's a lot of different ways to accomplish the same thing. It just depends on what do you need and what's the best workflow, depending on how you're, um, how you're working. Let's see, next question. Uh, let's see, using vault revision data, drawing rev to update, but access preview, previous drawings. Yeah, so what? let's just bump this one more time. So I can, once the file's been released, um, and so if I try to release something and I haven't fixed the criteria, this is what I was talking about in terms of vault has a way to block us from accidentally releasing data that doesn't have, that's not up to date, meaning that the drawing needs to have the same rev as the rev in vault. And so now that that's done, I can put this thing into release. And so the way that we go about it, so if I do a get right here, I'm downloading version a uh, rev E of the drawing. If I need to view um, or get an older version, I can use the same get command. And if I expand these two little dots, I can download rev C of something. We'll get the triangle icon that lets me know that what I have downloaded in my working folder is out of date. And at this point, when I browse and open up this drawing, um, we can see that I'm looking at Rev C version or a pre, uh, an older version of the drawing. And that's one of the beauty things about Vault is that it tracks the version of every file of who did what when. It tracks all of the revisions. And this is what allows me to be able to pull an older um, revision if I wanted to view the drawing. And we can see I still have the same information in Inventor in terms of and I could get a different revision inside of Inventor if I wanted to get Rev D, 
I could come in here and tell it I want to get Reb D and it will go and download and update the information and it would, would allow me to get um, the next one depending on what I need. Um, so hopefully that answers that. Let's see if there's any other questions. Let me check the chat. So the question is, let's see. So is that all common to admit the previous tracked rev of a legacy item? So let's say I have rev C legacy item and I check it in default and it auto checks it in as double A instead of C. Okay, according to my vault rules, sure. Is there any situation where it is right to leave it as AA? Um, that's something that you'll have to decide like in terms of how you wanna track your information. And so um, the workflow is slightly different, but the concept's the same in terms of um, so what I mean is let's come here, let's put this into a work in progress state so I can delete it because I don't, it's not recommended to have file-based security and items at the same time. And so let me just delete this out of vault. And let's put it back in here for a second and take a look. Um, so if I go to my working folder, um, let's, uh, extract all. Get this information back. Okay, so that's back, that's fine. Um, so in this case, since I'm going to be checking the file in and I don't want to use file-based life cycles because I'm gonna use item-based life cycles, I need to adjust um, my category settings and just change it so that it's not applying a file-based life cycle and then it's not applying a file-based revision scheme. So these are just a few things I need to do real quick to be able to demo this. So at this point, I should be able to load this information back into Vault, which will go back to engineering category, but it will have the correct properties. I'm on Rev C. It goes into Vault, it's in the right category but we're no longer using file based property or life cycles and so if i assign this to an item i'm going to default to whatever the rev scheme of the item is which will probably be um and so we'll save so anytime we assign something to an item we have to save it and so it's defaulted to rev a and so in this case sure i could technically if I wanted to start over, but because it's legacy, um, I would recommend to exit edit mode and come up here and do change revision. And since we know that we want this to be on Rev C, just change the, the item rev. So this way, sure it's a work in progress. Now the item rev matches the drawing rev and now I can, um, so I don't want to use, if I do a change state right here, I'm going to, it's going to try to, because I had the drawing selected, it tries to make me want to change the file state security, which is what I want to do. So you want to click outside of this associated box so that when I go do state change, I'm changing the state of the item. And at this point now I can release this particular item because I've already adjusted the revision of the item to match the revision of the legacy CAD file. Um, and in this case, you know, it's worth noting, I would do this similar thing, which is going to the revision property and adding a mapping for um, 
so right now this is mapping the system property for um, file, but I would also, I would edit it and I would make a mapping for items so that Vault knows how to check um, or basically push the item rev to the file. And so it's still mapped the same way. So user status is what, um, is what Vault sees the rev on, on. And so we want Vault to push the system item rev to the file. And then, so that should be all that we need. And And so at this point, if I go back to the item and I bump the version, so we leave the release state. So we're on release C. So I'm gonna bump, I'm gonna change the state of the item back to work in progress, which should bump the item rev so now the items at D, because I made the mapping, um, we can now synchronize the properties and get it to try to synchronize the rev item to the file so that the item is helping to update and making sure that the drawing stays um, in sync with the, with the drawing and the item rev so that they're, you know, to make sure that there's no issues. Um, so that's that in a nutshell, let's see. Correct. Um, so you can use other applications with Vault. Um, sure, there's a, a Vault add-in for SolidWorks. Um, for Fusion 360, um, you can sync that information into Inventor and then check in the Inventor. There's ways to do that. Um, but in the in the Vault Help, there's a there's a list. There's really almost the entire um, Vault collection from you know um, can interact with Vault and even non CAD files as well, like PDFs, Word documents, um, Vault commands, almost anything. So the question was: so if I understand correctly, to get the revision of a mapped property set up in a legacy file and use the link to a property to vault. Um, it needs to be added to a custom user defined property for each file called rev, sort of. So you basically need all of your files on the windows. Um, like if you're, however you're mapping the rev. So most likely you're mapping the rev by using the I property, um, which is fine. And so if you're tracking the revision number here, um, we just set up that first mapping to a custom user defined property uh, like re revision number so that Vault has an easy way of extracting the data so that when I did the, um, when I do a change state or when I try to do change revision, instead of having to come in here and manually type in every revision, um, every revision letter, if I was trying to update, you know, let's say a thousand different assemblies, it's far easier to map it to a user-defined property and get Vault to auto-populate. And then that just kind of reduces uh, manual error. Um, if you're tracking the rev number in the file or in a third-party tool, like uh, an Excel document or an access database, that's when you would really have to work with the reseller to kind of massage the data and make a, a package and, and, and bulk load it through like the DTU or, or other tools. And, and, this, and you have a similar thing when you're, you know, if you first start using uh, Vault Basic with Inventor and you're tracking the rev because, you know, Vault Basic doesn't have life cycles, they don't have categories. And so when you transition, you have a very similar transition when you're going from Vault Basic to Workgroup or, or Basic to Pro is how do you get the rev number from the file? 
how do you get Vault to update the system rev so that you can move forward? Um, and so this, what I demo is just one way to do it. Um, so if you're, if the file, if you had legacy files that were AutoCAD, um, in that case, the metadata needs to be saved somewhere. The rev has to be saved somewhere that Vault can read. And so your options are a custom property, you know, temp rev, and then track the, the rev value here. It could be, so that's one place where it could be, but you basically need the metadata in a way that Vault can read it because we need to map, it, map it. in this particular example, we need to map it to a property so that we can have that auto fill in. Um, Cause if not, you're, you're paying an intern, you know, to check the rev, come in here, change the revision and manually change the revision of everything um, as, it, as it's needed. Um, and so if you have the metadata in a property and you can get synced to a user-defined property, we can use that user-defined property along with the um, change revision command. And this is where the power comes from is if we link this to a property, then we can get Vault to auto fill in all of these this information. We don't have to come in here and manually type in a thousand different revs depending on and having to know what rev every assembly is at. I think that's almost all the questions. Uh, we have a few more minutes if anyone has any last minute questions. Um, the big thing to think about is that when you make the change to Vault from any, any whether it's Windows file store or if it's um, you know, Dropbox, you know, eventually you're gonna have to centralize uh, library files, whether the content center files or XRFs for AutoCAD, uh, you know, you're going to have to centralize and move over all of your start parts and templates. And, and most importantly, you know, you're eventually going to have to decide how many categories do you need because the categories is what controls what properties are, are, are visible and what get mapped. And you know, it could be as simple as one property for all engineering data. It could be as complex as you know, uh, 12 or 20 categories for every, you know, one for parts, one for assemblies, one for drawings, and you know, everything in between. Um, the nice thing about Vault is that it's configurable. And you know, I've lost count how many different Vault customers I've interacted with, and I've never seen Vault set up the same way twice. Similar, absolutely, but everyone has a unique thing in terms of what they call their states, what's the revision scheme, how they organize files. And so Vault can really adapt and meet all of your needs depending on how you want to organize things. It really comes down to is making hard decisions because the decisions you're making now, either you're, you're going to uh, inherit other problems or someone later on the line is going to inherit your decisions. Um, and this directly affects the ease of which it is to link Vault to other business tools like an ERP system or a PLM system. And uh, the, the last thing I'll leave you for today, the most important feature to turn on when you implement any Vault is enforce unique file name and that will prevent us from being able to add two files to Vault with the same exact name. And so if you remember nothing, it's that uh, unfortunate file name should be turned on because having one file in Vault with one name will make it uh, a lot easier in terms of linking to other business tools later, keeping your bill of material and uh, files organized, and it'll make it easier to reuse something because without this, if you had, you know, uh, red button one in vault in 12 different locations, you, there's no way to know what size red button one is if, and if they've all been modified or not. And then, you know, that starts to really get into the way of, of probably, you know, one of the cornerstones of vault, which is data reuse. We don't want to spend time remodeling a button if it's in the library, but 
we can't reuse content if we can't find it or if we don't know what it is that we want. And so those are things to think about. Um, let's see, one last question. So how can you establish network load on large multi-site and Vault Pro shared syncing vaults? Um, so I assume you're, so basically if you have multiple vaults and you're, you know, whether that's fully replicated or using an AVFS server, it's, it's still basically the same in terms of file replication. And so the, the load really comes down to, first off, it's, you know, by default, most time you would set file syncing between um, faults um, to run at night, because you're basically syncing usually between uh, states or continents. And so you want to take advantage of the point-to-point -point or, or WAN network structure at nighttime when, when the rest of the business isn't using it. But I've also seen uh, customers with high throughput site-to-site um, -site connection sync their vault every uh, hour and, and or four hours or eight hour intervals. And so um, it's the, when you sync it, you know, the first time when you set it up is the largest sync, but um, when file replication syncs between two vaults, it's really, it's only syncing all the things that have been checked in within that day or that eight hour period. And so the load is really dictated on how many files are uh, changed in that given time period. Great, well, I, I appreciate everyone um, for coming. And, uh, you know, if you have any suggestions or, you know, for other topics or are interested in um, anything else, definitely let us know. And uh, I, I look forward to talking to you guys later.